What I love about events like this is not that we all came here to hear good ideas, it's not that we came here to network and share information with each other, it's because we all have one thing in common here today, and it's what, when we woke up this morning, it's what made us decide to come and show up here today. And that's, we all are passionate about data in some form or another. We understand that data matters, that it helps people make informed decisions, it helps people make better decisions if that data is shared with us and shown to us in the right way. And it doesn't matter if you're a teacher or a government policy writer or a business person or a parent. The ability to make better decisions is directly linked with, your, with the, the level and the quality of the data that's shown to us. And I think the problem these days, if that's going to work, there we go. Um, the problem these days is, you know, we, as companies and organizations, we're creating more and more data, and that's a trend that's only going to increase over the coming years. And, you know, the natural thing to do with data when we gather it is share it and put it out into the world, because we want people to make decisions based on it. And what happens is a lot of that data is being shared in ways or visualized in ways that is confusing or doesn't make sense. And what it's doing is putting a lot of noise out there into the market. So I think the challenge for all of us in this room in the next few years is how do we increase the signal of our message, the signal behind our data, and how do we reduce the noise? Now, that could be the noise that's inside our data as it is, or it can be the noise of all the data in the market. And that's what I want to talk about today. Because what we see is if we use story in combination with data, it's one of the most powerful ways to get people to make a decision based on the data that we've worked so hard to, to bring about. So why story? Well, we're kind of hardwired to listen to stories. It's what we've been doing for thousands and thousands of generations. You know, we share stories because they're memorable and they're impactful. That's why, you know, how we remember information, how we share information. It's why nursery rhymes came about, to help children remember things and understand the world around them. But why story and data? So it turns out a few years ago, there was a study done by a lady called uh, Deborah Small, who's a professor of psychology and marketing at Wharton University in the States. And they were tasked with understanding what would, what would it take for us to increase the amount of money that people give to charity. So when they launched the study, they put people into two groups. And the first group was shown this brochure, which had data and statistics on child poverty and child hunger uh, in Africa. The second group was shown exactly the same brochure, but they had an additional page, and that was a story about Rokia. And Rokia is an eight-year-old girl who lives in Mali, and you could see what her day-to-day -day life was like and the challenges that she had. Now, the interesting thing for us is at the end of the study, when people were leaving, they said to them, do you want to uh, donate some money to uh, save the children? And if you do, then you can put some money in the box that's by the door when you leave. And what they found is that the people who'd been exposed to the brochure with a story about Rokia gave twice as much money as those who actually just get, who just were exposed to the version of the brochure with the data. Now, what that shows us is if you can get somebody to emotionally connect to the story or the meaning behind your data, they're much more likely to donate twice as much money as those who didn't. And that kind of goes against everything that we've learned in the past, or we thought in the past. You know, we always thought that we make decisions using the left-hand side of our brain, the analytical side of our brain. But what we're learning more and more in deeper ways is that, like it or not, most of us make most of our decisions, first of all, on an emotional basis, and then we use the left-hand side of our brain to justify that decision using the data. And that's really important for us, because we need to make sure, if I've worked really hard to put this data together, how, what's the emotional link that's going to get somebody to connect to that, and then I can show them the data that they trust and that they believe is, is really solid. I'll give you another example. Many of you may have watched this TED talk by David McCandless, who did a, a talk on the beauty of data visualization. And he's a data journalist, so as a journalist, he's a storyteller at heart. And what he did all the way through the talk is keep people on the edge of their seats by doing exactly that, using a combination of story and data to reveal the meaning. And towards the end of the talk, 
he spoke about the volcano in Iceland that erupted back in 2010. And as you remember, it caused a lot of travel chaos. Millions of people were stranded everywhere. And the media started to report how much CO2 that the volcano was putting into the atmosphere. And it put 150,000 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Now, what David and his team did is they said, OK, so what else is going on at that moment in time? And they looked at all of the aeroplanes that would have been in the sky in that airspace during the same time, and they were due to give out 345,000 tons of CO2. Now, 60% of those planes were grounded, which meant 205,000 tons less CO2 in the atmosphere. So, as he said in his talk, what you had here was the first carbon-neutral volcano. Now, I think that's a really beautiful way of kind of talking about Edward Tufte's you know, kind of sage advice, as always, about show data variation, not design variation. Because even if we can get people to connect emotionally to the story that we tell, we need them to believe the robustness of the data. And sometimes that's about showing them different data sets, which completely changes the picture. So because of people like David and data journalism in general, we're seeing a lot more of these things, which is very beautiful data visualizations. This is one from the Guardian newspaper in the UK. But for me, as much as it's on the rise, and that's a great thing, these are still crafted by talented designers using bespoke software such as D3. Now, for me, this is just the tip of the iceberg. The vast majority of the data out there that's creating that noise kind of ends up looking like this, or this, or this. And that doesn't really help us make decisions. It certainly doesn't help us connect to anything, and it's really hard. So, if we want to reduce the noise out there of data, this is the challenge that we have. We need to help and to get people to change how they visualize even the most basic of data. And when we look at things like that, the choices are down to us. Those kind of charts start out life in something like Excel or Google. And it's up to us to decide, how do I visualize that? And I think that's where, where just having a very few s short things, we can make a big difference. Because there's only really four things that we look at when we want to share data. We want to look at data over time. We want to compare data. We want to look at the relationship between different data. Or we want to look at the whole versus the parts of the whole. And if we go into those in a bit more detail, there's a lot you can do to improve it. So if we're sharing a data over time, which is where really we're showing a trend over time, then the only thing we should be doing is a line graph. And left to its own devices, a line graph will come out of Excel looking like that. So if I go back to the signal versus the noise, and I want to get rid of the noise, I want to get rid of the distraction, then I'll take away anything that's not relevant and turn it to gray to let the main message stand out, and I'll relabel it. Because the title of any chart or data that you put out there should reflect the main point. So it goes from this to this. So straight away, I say, OK, so there was a UK sales turnaround. And yes, I can see that from you know, January to May, sales were bad, and something awesome happened in May that turned it around to the end of the year. And now I'm back with a presenter who hopefully is going to tell me that awesome story that happened in May. So what about comparing data? So if we're comparing data, and this is probably how most of the data in the world is actually showcased, is actually through bar charts and column charts. But again, we have certain choices that we can make. You know, if we have long data labels, then use a horizontal bar chart, because it's much easier for us to read data labels when they're like that, as opposed to vertically or uh, diagonally at the bottom. And it's also good when there's a lot of data, because we can process top down and work out the length of the bars really, really quick. If we have negative data points in our data, then using a vertical bar chart is better, because we can much clearly see the difference between the negative and the positive. But it doesn't end there, because, again, something like this will come out, so it hides the message. So again, using color, we want to gray everything out and put a big signpost saying, this is the main point of this slide. This is what I want people to focus on. So what about whole part comparisons? Now, this, unfortunately, is where I have to talk about pie charts. And I really don't like pie charts. I think they're one of the, the weakest ways that you can visualize data. And worse than that, it can actually distort data, which this is a great example of. You may be fooled into thinking when you glance at that pie chart that the green slice is the biggest, when in fact it's not. Because, first of all, the green is a vivid green, so it stands out more than the blue and the red, which is a little bit calmer. And the pie is a 3D pie chart that's tilted up a little bit at the bottom, which makes the bottom slice look bigger. And thirdly, the white text on that green 
isn't very good in terms of contrast, so you might miss actually what that number is. And the red slice is 10% is bigger, but it doesn't look like the biggest slice. So again, for me, the only accurate pie chart is something like this. Pie that I've eaten, pie that I haven't eaten. But all joking aside, if you do use a pie chart, then it's only really good if you use it for up to four or five data points, because then you can still see what it's trying to tell you. If you double the data points, then straight away it starts to become meaningless and doesn't really do anything. So for me, please, no pie charts. It's much better to use a stacked bar chart, because again, our brains can work out if the yellow or the white is bigger very quickly, much quicker than we can do in something like a pie chart. Good examples, again, where you use color. So here we have the color that represents the two political parties, and this shows what they, see on, uh, what they think about each of the issues down the axes. So again, it can be very powerful at getting the message. You can also use it if you need to do an additive variable, because again, we can very quickly see out of each of those bars which one, the white is the biggest, the green is the biggest, the yellow is the biggest. And finally, there's tree maps. And I'm a big fan of tree maps, but they're a little bit harder for people to produce automatically in things like Excel. But again, you know, it's very effective at showing the differences between uh, the whole, and especially when you start using color. Finally, the relationship between data. So if I'm looking at, I don't know, how much marketing money we spent versus what the revenue was, then things like scatter charts are what we should use, because you can very clearly see the difference. Now, if you have a third data set which changes the size, then you can use a bubble chart. And that's where I'll leave it, because I'm about out of time. But I guess, you know, I'll leave you with a quote from Toy Story. Well, it's, it's a quote from the guy who wrote to Toy Story. And he said, make me care. Emotionally, intellectually, aesthetically, just make me care, when he was talking about storytelling. And I think that's what we need to remember. If we're trying to help people make better decisions, then it's pointless going to data first to make that argument. We need to use story in tandem, because that is going to help people not only remember and be persuaded by it, but they'll be emotionally connected to it. Thank you very much.